I've been doing some short videos on all three volumes of Karl Marx's Capital as part of a reading group I'm in. I've been a bit nervous about doing this video on volume three. Um, like volume two, Marx died before he managed to complete it and he left a jumble of manuscripts for Engels to knock into shape. And it took Engels nine years to get this volume ready for publication and it kind of more or less killed him off. He died less than a year later. Um, now, some people get rather snarky about what Engels did with the version that he put together for volume three. And I have to say, I'm, I'm just more in awe that he managed to complete the task at all. Now, volumes one and two dig kind of quite deep into the underlying foundations of the capitalist system. And they use lots of kind of quite complex jargon, surplus value, um, concrete and abstract labour, constant and variable capital that kind of are a bit difficult to wrap your head around. Uh, it takes a while to get used to. By comparison, volume three uses categories that I guess are rather more familiar to us. Things like profit, credit, interest, rent. But really what our Marx is arguing in volume three is that these are only surface level categories. They, they're forms of appearance of the deeper level categories that he explored in volumes one and two. But make no mistake, these surface level categories also do have a concrete reality, which is really important to remember. Capitalists really do make profits. Bankers charge interest, landlords collect rent. But they're kind of mystified forms of appearance that mask the social relations of exploitation between capitalists and workers that give rise to them. And in volume three, the, the concrete forms of surplus value are a particular focus. Profit and surplus value, Marx argues, are in one sense two different terms for the same thing. Profit, though, is also a form of mystification. It appears to emerge from the operations of the capitalist market and the clever manoeuvrings of the capitalist. Presented in such common sense terms, the origins of profit or surplus value in the exploitation of labour is masked. One of the things Marx does in volume three is investigate the movements of profit on the surface level of capitalist societies, including the long term tendency for the rate of profit to decline. And we also learn when reading volume three why the assumption that is made through volumes one and two that commodities exchange in the marketplace at their values is in fact not true. Marx also explains how profit decomposes into a number of different forms, including taxes, interest and rent. And over several hundred pages of frankly complex and at times confusing analysis, I think an arguably simple story emerges. All the various sources of income and wealth clothes, cars and homes, stocks, shares and credit, interest, rent and speculation can all ultimately be traced back to the surplus value produced by the workers. And I think this kind of leads to an important conclusion really that Marx makes, uh, that class struggle in capitalist societies is at heart a struggle over the share of the surplus value produced by the workers. The three volumes of Capital stretch over 2,000 pages, and if you read them with the expectation that you're going to find some blueprint for a future socialist or communist society, you're going to be disappointed. There's hints and suggestions about what such a society might look like, but these three volumes are really much more about understanding how capitalism mm -hmm. works. And I think there's a lot of importance there for, for thinking about what a future society might look like. I think one of the things I take from these, th these three volumes is that merely naming the problem is never going to be enough. You know, we might understand that capitalism is grounded in forms of exploitation and that the surface level categories like profit and rent and interest and the wage conceal and mystify these, uh, these underlying relations of exploitation. But this knowledge, just knowing that, doesn't make the real world exploitation magically disappear. 
But I think the other thing and the important thing I take from all three volumes, and this includes volume three, is that there's nothing natural or given about capitalism. It's not the only way that a society can be organised. All imaginable societies, Marx argues, must produce and reproduce, and capitalism is an example of that. But it's only one possible way for societies to operate. I think one of the kind of challenging and interesting things about Marx is that he was actually quite excited by what capitalism offered, as well as being horrified by it. You know, the extraordinary productivity and potential unleashed by capitalism created, in his view, the material foundations for a higher society, a higher form of society, one where collective control of production and distribution would make genuine human flourishing possible. The last sentence of volume three is, in a funny sort of way, one of my favourite sentences, and it's written by Engels, not by Marx. But I kind of think it, it illustrates just how incomplete and challenging it was, really, to come to any definitive conclusions. This is what the final sentence of volume three says, written by Engels. At this point, the manuscript breaks off. <laughs>